that they go to that drop of rain from heaven and they pursue that drop of rain from heaven as if they never tasted water in their life. That's how fish react to rain. In a similar way, the Talmud says the Jewish people are compared to fish and the Jewish people also, though they're raised in Torah and they're in an ocean of Torah and they always study the Torah, yet when a new insight of Torah arrives to the world, the Jewish people gravitate and they're attracted to this new thought of Torah as if they never tasted the thought of Torah in their life, as if they never had any Torah in their life. This, for a Jew, here's a new thought of Torah. For a Jew, it's like something brand new as, and it's so delicious that it's like we never had this experience before. This is especially true when a new insight from our Rebbe is discovered and was not published for over 60 years. And now all of a sudden it sees, it's published, it sees the light of print. And it, the Rebbe once said how when things come into print, that means there's a, there's a new revelation of that same Torah teaching. So it certainly behooves us to pay attention to this Torah teaching, especially because it's very obviously relevant. In the Torah portion this week, the Torah tells us, B'tzedek tishpot amisecha. You should judge your fellow with righteousness. And Rashi explains, judge people favorably. And this talk of the Rebbe that was just discovered explains this exact idea, together with two other ideas from chapter one in Ethics of Our Fathers. Right now it's customary between Passover and Rosh Hashanah to study every Shabbat one chapter of Ethics of Our Fathers. And although this week we are studying already chapter three, and this is from chapter one, but again, it's relevant to the time we're in, the circumstances that we're in, and especially it's relevant to today's Torah portion. The Torah portion is divided in seven parts. And when there are two Torah portions, we divide the double portion in seven parts. And the message for today is judge your fellow favorably. So let's get right to it. This teaching is based upon the Mishnah of Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachya. Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachya taught three things. First of all, he taught you should provide yourself with a teacher. You should acquire for yourself a friend. And you should judge everyone favorably. I find this extremely relevant because, first of all, we're in a time where everybody has questions because it's a time of such uncertainty. Number two, the fact that the finances are all different and there's more pressure in the house makes things, makes the human interpersonal relationships that much harder as uh, the saying goes that when the peace in the home when, when the money departs peace at home god forbid can depart as well and there's a lot of insight in this mishnah for first of all especially people who are dealing with illness you know your mind does a lot of tricks on you when you are aren't feeling well and so, especially if you're alone all the time and you only have your thoughts to think about, it's that much harder to keep yourself on track and think in a healthy way that, that benefits you and benefits the people around you. So in this insight of Rabbi Shuman Prachya, he tells us about the whole spectrum of our interpersonal relationships and which have all changed. And especially with the removal of, of the, our day-to-day -day and our usual pressures and usual things. And all we're left with now is being face-to-face -face with our families and only with our families all the time, or worse, or being alone all the time and thinking you know, that you're forgotten by the whole world and you're alone. And there's lots, very easy to, for, for these thoughts to breed enmity and, and apathy and self-pity. So we have a treasure in this Mishnah, which we'll see the three gems of wisdom we get from the three te teachings of Yeshub and Prachya, which have special significance to us. So let's go right to the first teaching. Yeshub and Prachya says, you should 
make for yourself a teacher. The word he uses, make, is significant. And the surface, the fact you have to have a teacher, it's obvious you have to have a teacher. I mean, how else are you going to get an objective perspective without having a teacher? The Talmud says a person can see all their diseases except for their own. You could see the diseases, the spiritual maladies, the blemishes, the faults of other people, but it's harder to notice your own. Call on the Goyim Adam Rayod, all you see on, on the outside, it's, you could see objectively, but your own diseases, you can't see them. So therefore you need to have a spiritual mentor who could guide you and to enlighten you about, about things, your own shortcomings. You cannot see them yourself. So, and especially, that, that's because of how we get blinded from seeing our own, our own shortcomings. But even without that issue, hey, Yuda, there's another issue. Another issue is that everyone has certain talents and abilities and having someone in your life that could be objective to guide you what your talents are and where you should direct your energies considering your station and your circumstances, it's really important to have someone out there that, that can guide you. I just saw this week a response the Rebbe gave to Rabbi Yeshua Tzayt Malvashon, who was an incredible chassid. And yet, you could see from the Rebbe's response to him that he was totally in the wrong place. The Rebbe sent him a very sharp letter. He said, I got, the Rebbe said, I, got, I received your letter. I got your letter. It's a wonder that you don't, you haven't memorized, and it's not in your heart, the beginning of chapter 41 in Tanya. Ouch. What does it say in chapter 41 in Tanya? It says you should always visualize how God is upon you and he's examining your heart and mind. And the Rebbe instructed this chassid of Yeshua to put those words on a piece of paper and keep them in his pocket all the time, except for Shabbat. And the Rebbe added, put it also in the pocket of your heart. Our heart contains lots of things. So put this inside the pocket of your heart. Put God's presence in the pocket of your heart. Think about how Hashem is always watching you. That should be something that you care about and you pay attention to. So he was in the wrong place and he had no idea he was in the wrong place. And he, he is experiencing what he thought was a moment of truth, turning towards the Rebbe, asking for the Rebbe's advice. And yet the Rebbe says to him, no, you need to be in a totally different place. So clearly, to know where you need to go, to know what you're about, it's advisable to have a teacher. Something we know. The Rebbe said, it's actually, it's a bakasha nafshis. It's a request from the Rebbe's soul. And more, that each person should have a personal, spiritual mentor. And despite that, the Mishnah of Pirkei Avot, which is meant really, Pirkei Avot is not meant to tell us simple things. Pirkei Avot is meant to tell us it's supposed to tell us how to be exceedingly pious, how to go beyond the letter of the law, how to do things which aren't so obvious. And here it seems that this mission is telling us the most obvious and elementary thing that everyone knows. You need to have a guide, you need to have a spiritual mentor, and it's, it's, it's critical to have one. So why do we need this Mishnah to tell us this? Second teaching of the Mishnah. Acquire for yourself a friend. Get a friend. It's also a simple thing. It's also an obvious thing. In tractate brachot, the Talmud tells us that Torah could only be acquired with the group. You cannot figure out Torah by yourself. You need to have other opinions as a thrust and parry, questions and answers you have when you study with someone else. You can't figure out Torah by yourself. The Talmud says further, the Talmud says, Ein Adam Omid al Torah, El Imkein You cannot understand the Torah unless you first misunderstand. You have to misunderstand Torah first before you could possibly understand the Torah. You can't get Torah just simply by reading it. You have to first misunderstand it. So what then does Pirkei Avot mean when it tells us to, to acquire a friend? Obviously, you have to have a friend. The third teaching of Yeshua and Prachia also needs to be understood. What's his third teaching? His third teaching is judge everybody favorably. Well, I am not Judge Judy. I am not standing in court. I am not the judge of, of your case. What difference should it make to God how I judge you? What difference should it make to you how I judge you? I can judge you 
and that has little bearing on the truth. Like Maimonides says, people think Maimonides says, that when people think something, it becomes the truth. Maimonides says, if a thousand people believe something, it does not become any more true. And if one person believes something, it doesn't become any less true. Truth is truth. Maimonides gives various, various classifications about truth. He says, you could have something in a book, and just because it's in a book doesn't mean it's true. So why is it pertinent how I judge you or how you judge me if we are not, we're not sitting in the seat of judgment anyway? So why is Mishnah caution us to judge everyone favorably? Why is it important? So let's go to our first question first. What is the Mishnah telling us that you should provide yourself with a guide? The Mishnah is using a word. And that word is meant to highlight for us the Mishnah is not telling us that we have to have a guide. The Mishnah is telling us how we have to have a guide. The Mishnah uses the word ase. It's a similar word used in the Code of Jewish Law in regards to the laws of charity. The Mishnah says in the laws of charity that every Jew is obligated to give charity. Everyone, even someone who receives charity themselves, is obligated to give charity themselves. So imagine this guy who's going around collecting money for food and the Torah says he has to give charity himself. And the guy needs to buy dinner because he, and he went, ran around the neighborhood collecting quarters and dimes until he had enough money to buy dinner. And then the Torah goes and says to him, hey, you got to share some of that with someone else. It's not an easy thing. So the Torah says that in certain instances, the Jewish court coerces a person, they force a person to give charity. The Jewish court, in certain instances, it's not done today, the Jewish court coerces someone to give charity. Imagine how hard it is for that person to part with that money that he could have used for his own food. And that is why the mission is using this word, because when it comes to choosing a spiritual mentor, it could be extremely challenging. Think about this. The Talmud says that a teacher, a mentor, should be someone who is angelic. If they're angelic, then you, you should choose them as your mentor. If not, do not choose them as your mentor. How many people do you know that are angelic? Not too many, right? Angelic beings who do not care about the physical things at all, and they're only preoccupied with things that really matter. That's what an angelic being is, just like some, an angel in heaven doesn't care about the physical things, doesn't care about it about pride, doesn't care about money, doesn't care about anything physical. It's totally altruistic. So how are you supposed to find someone like that? So you may think, okay, that is a noble pursuit. I would respect someone if they really were looking for someone in the Himalayas, some wise hermit in the Himalayas to choose that person to be their spiritual mentor. But I am certainly not going to do that because it's way too difficult. So the Mishnah says, I say, you've got to, Commit yourself. You got to push yourself. You got to apply pressure within yourself and give up yourself so that you can achieve this connection with a spiritual mentor. So you could find a spiritual mentor. And even after you find a spiritual mentor, you're not done yet. There are many people that have, if you ask them, do you have a spiritual mentor? They'll say, sure, I have a spiritual mentor. When have you spoken to them last? I know many people, I ask them, who's your spiritual mentor? They say, Ramendal Futafas, who is passed away in 1994. That's my spiritual mentor. I'm sure he's not calling you on the phone asking you how you're doing. I mean, having a spiritual mentor is not enough to officially have a spiritual mentor. Yes, a mental foot of us is an excellent choice, perhaps. Not necessarily, by the way, because the Rebbe says that your spiritual mentor should be someone who is easily accessible to you and all the more accessible when you have questions often. Like the Rebbe said, for example, that a child should not choose the head of the yeshiva to be his personal spiritual mentor because children have lots of questions. And the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the yeshiva, will not be available to answer all their questions. So that you have to choose someone who's accessible to you. I know myself that I had a spiritual mentor when I was living in New York, and it became hard for me to reach that person because they're not that tech savvy, savvy and they don't like using the cell phone. So I had to choose someone else. I moved to Los Angeles because I needed to ask questions often, often enough that necessitated me to switch to a different spiritual mentor. So the Mishra is telling us you not only have to make the effort to 
choose someone, you also have to stay, make the effort to stay connected to that person. You have to make sure that you're asking those questions that, that really count to that person. Don't ask them only the questions that are, uh, you know, the questions that make you look good. The questions like Esau would ask Jacob, Dad, how do you celebrate, um, a, how do you tithe salt? You know, some people only turn to spiritual mentor because they want to pat on their back. I just want to ask this question because I know it will make me look good. So Misha tells us, I say, you've got to push yourself and ask the harder questions to make you vulnerable. And even though that answer you get may not be something you're comfortable with, the Misha tells us, I say, push yourself to accept the advice of a spiritual mentor. I want to qualify that and say the following. A friend of mine told me that he was in, with, in an audience with the Rebbe. I'm paraphrasing for what I remember. I heard this from him a number of years ago. He said that he felt living as a Baal Teshuvah, as a newly minted returnee to Judaism, he felt that a lot of people in the Hasidic neighborhood in Brooklyn where he was living were just like zombies following other people. And he questioned the Rebbe about what he saw. The Rebbe responded to him with the following words. These words I do remember. Nothing, there is no substitute or there's no exchange or substitute for exercising your free will. Every person has to use their own free will. You have to use your own free will. You cannot just say, okay, I'm going to rely on my mentor. They'll decide for me. That's not why God sent a soul into this world, that someone else should choose things, choose things for you. It's not sufficient just to rely on a spiritual mentor. You also have to share and think and feel for yourself. Your mentor may give you advice, which isn't for you because you're not ready to hear it, because you're not on the level to hear it, because it wasn't, doesn't know you. So asay l'charav further means to give of yourself and share of yourself to get the advice that's meant for you in your situation. So this coercion in finding the guy, this coercion in staying connected to the guy, and this coercion in sharing those things that may make you feel uncomfortable. And even after you do that, number one, there's a fourth thing, and that is applying it to yourself. Make sure that you've got the right relationship between you and your mentor so that you know how to apply it to your situation. There are a lot of rabbis who are sought after all over the world and they don't have a lot of time for you, not because they're bad people, because they're so busy. They get calls, they're really worth their salt and everyone's calling them. And therefore you could easily not get the right answer to your question because they didn't have a, enough time to find out what was really bothering you. That's why it's important to have the right person that could be sensitive to you and feel you. I mentioned the word guy, just to qualify. The Rebbe says men should choose men, women should choose women as their spiritual mentor. Seeking advice. In this week's Torah portion, it gives us insight about giving advice too. And that's also connected to the second instruction in this Mishnah. The second instruction in the Mishnah is acquire for yourself a friend. Again, it's obvious you have to have a friend. We need, everyone needs friends. What the Mishnah is not telling us you have to have a friend. The mission is telling us what a friend is and how to get one. Ptolemy, the king of Greece, once asked the sages, he got 70 sages together, and he asked them, how can I get friends? And they told him, the way to get friends is by being a friend to others and not thinking about anything else in return. So someone who is a friend is someone who is dedicated and committed to a relationship. So how can you get one of those guys? How can you get such a good friend? The way to get a friend, the Mishnah tells us, is by acquiring them. Why is that word significant? Acquiring, when do you acquire something? When do you give your well-earned money towards a thing? Because that thing is precious to you. That's why the Mishnah later on in chapter six of Ethics of Our Fathers, it says God acquired five things in the world. Why is the mission use the word acquire? Because the Mishnah wants to denote how those things are very precious to God. Therefore, the mission uses the word God acquired those things. They, they, he cares about those, those things. He cares about Abraham and the Torah and the Jewish people and the temple. So the Torah says God acquired those things, indicating how God is invested and cares about those things. 
So in the same way, the Mishnah is not telling us what a friend is, and yet the Mishnah is telling us how valuable and how precious a friend is. And therefore, it's worth it. It's, no matter what's going on in your life, you're in quarantine, and there are you have to invest in the relationship. You have to put yourself out there to make it happen, to connect with other people, because it won't happen by itself. It requires an investment. It requires the same kind of investment as it does We need to make a purchase. It's a precious thing. It's a different kind of relationship than that of to a teacher. A teacher is more someone you revere. You trust their opinion. You you make they may care for you and you may care for them, but the underlying relationship is they're your mentor. You're you look at them as a mentor, you have some kind of reverence for them. A friend, Talmud says, Mi ika can there be friendship with God? With God, our underlying relationship is that God is God, He's above us. So when the Misha tells us to acquire a friend, the Misha is telling us that there's a the, the kind of relationship you're looking for is friendship and closeness. It's different the relationship between you and your teacher. That's aselacha. That's where you abnegate yourself and you have a subservience towards your teacher. Versus a friend, there's love and closeness and sharing, and it's worth investing in it. On that note, getting. Getting back to giving advice. In this week's Torah portion, we're told, do not place a stumbling block before a blind man. What does that mean? So it means don't give someone bad advice. So it's a very interesting discrepancy between the way Rashi presents this idea to the way the Midrash, the Torah's Kodim, presents the idea. Rashi's source is actually from the Torah's Kodim, and yet Rashi veers from the Torah's Kodim and it brings a different version of what this means. The Torah's coin gives three examples of what it means to not place a stumbling block before a blind man. Example number one, a Kohen wants to marry someone. Don't suggest for the Kohen someone who is not kosher for a Kohen to marry. Don't give them bad advice. Don't put a, don't put a stumbling block before a blind man. Don't present to that person something which isn't good for that person. Example number two, when someone needs to take a trip, they need to travel somewhere, don't advise them to travel at a time or in a, in a journey, in a place, in a route where bandits may attack them. Don't tell them to travel at a time where they may get hurt because it's, it, the sun will be out and they're going to get hurt. They're going to be in pain during their journey because it's so hot outside. So the mission tells us, don't give a person bad advice. Don't tell the Kohen to marry someone who's not kosher for them. Don't tell someone to travel at a time which is not opportune for them. But there's a third example. The third example is, and this is the only example that Rashi mentions. Rashi says, what does it mean to give someone, not to give someone bad advice? Rashi says, if someone has a field, and they're considering selling their field and bartering their field in exchange for a donkey. And you want to advise them to switch the field for the donkey because you want to be able to get the field from the person they purchased it from. So Rashi says, do not advise someone to switch their field for the donkey so that you'll be able to somehow maneuver and get the field from that person. The commentaries explain why you'll be able to get the field from the other person there may be a lien on the property in the original uh, owner's hands, but not a lien in the second owner's hands. Whatever, it's not, it's a, it's, but the point is you shouldn't give the person advice for the purpose of getting that field. Now, all of the examples to us make perfect sense. But Rashi only mentions the more cryptic example with a more, which has a few more details. Don't tell someone to switch their field with a donkey if you want to get the field. Let's break this down a little bit. The guy has a field. He wants to switch it for a donkey or not. What's better, a field or a donkey? Well, there's advantages in both. Depends what's going on. Depends what the person needs at that time. Depends what kind of field. Depends what kind of donkey. Depends on a lot of things. So if it's a bad choice for the person to switch the field for the donkey, then Rashi should stop there. Don't tell someone to switch their field for a donkey if it's a bad move. So obviously, we must be talking about a scenario where switching the field for the donkey is a great move. It's a good idea for this person in this scenario to switch his field for the donkey. 
So then tell him that. What's wrong? Why not tell him, switch the field for the donkey? What does Rashi mean? So the answer is like this. Rashi always tries to tell us the simple meaning of the Torah. The Torah tells us you're not allowed to dig a pit in a public area because it causes damage. It causes damage. Someone may fall into that pit. In a similar way, you can't do something that can later cause damage to someone else. Any kind of damage. So in all other analogies that the Torah's con and bring, Rashi says, we know those things already. We know you can't tell someone to marry someone who isn't kosher for them. We know you can't tell someone to travel and in a time which is, that's, that's directly damaging the person. That's putting out a pit for that person. You're laying a pitfall. You tell someone to travel during a time where they're getting sunburned, so you are putting out a pit for that person. That's something we know already. Well, what's unique over here is that the scenario is where your advice is good. Your advice is beneficial. But there's another, there's a, there's a, there's a side issue over here. The, for this person, it's actually beneficial for them to switch their ox, their field for an ox, for, their, for a donkey. And you think that way. And you know that's better for them. The Torah says, don't stop there when giving advice. Don't just give advice that's sound. Good advice doesn't just mean advice that is good and sensible. Good advice means advice that comes from the best place in your heart. Your advice should come from the good place within you. Your advice has to be advice that comes from the best place in you that you care about this person. So although it may be, although it may be beneficial for that person to switch the field to the donkey, you're not finished yet. You can't tell that person anything or to give that person advice. You have to divest yourself completely from the scenario and not think about your benefit. And only then can you venture to put yourself into that person's shoes and feel them and give them advice for them, how you care about them. To give someone advice, the Torah is telling us, you can't think about yourself to be in their shoes. This is very, very uh, pertinent to all of us to, when we, we are approached about various questions, the first thing the Torah tells us is feel the person, be in their shoes, love them, care for them. This is true for a mentor, this is true for a friend. You have to be in that person's shoes. It's not enough that the device is, the device is sensible. It's also true also for preconceived notions, not just in, a, in the scenario that Rashi mentions, there's a, is an agenda. Even if you don't have an agenda, but you may be in a lousy mood. I know I was once in a synagogue in La Brea and I was, in, and I was praying to God and I was thinking about how long the exile is and I was a little bit upset. And then I went to the synagogue next door, which had air conditioning. And all of a sudden the exile didn't feel so long. We're, we, we're very... Uh, connected to our circumstances and we may give someone advice because we ate something that day you know because we wrote what we, we got out of the bed in the wrong the wrong place the wrong way that day our advice has to be in a way that we're totally feeling the other person and giving them something that's good for them nothing to do with what's going on in our life i once asked this psychologist a foolish question but it was a question that i had I noticed a lot of times that a lot of psychologists, psychologists and psychiatrists who are experts in the human condition have children which are very challenged. And I asked them this phenomenon that I noticed a lot of psychologists have, they have children who are really challenged. And you would think that these psychologists, psychiatrists, their children will be, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be minted, perfect, without any challenges, without any issues. This person told me, that very often the reason a person becomes a psychologist, why does someone become motivated to be a psychiatrist or psychologist? Very often it's because they are running away from something. They had, they, they had some kind of experience in their life that they, in order to counter that, they, they adopted this wisdom of psychology or psychiatry in order to be able to deal with their own personal issues. And therefore they may be giving off something of that to their children, trying to push them in one direction when the child was really, you know, okay being in the middle, but instead they're being pushed off to the side. That's just an aside. But the point is, the second instruction of the Mishnah is to give, to be a friend for others, acquire a friend, invest yourself in the relationship. And now we have the third instruction of the Mishnah. Third instruction of the Mishnah is judge everyone favorably. We asked before, who cares what you say about someone else? Who cares how you judge them? Judge them favorably. Don't judge them fav favorably. What's the difference? So let's 
examine the opposite of judging someone favorably. The opposite of judging, judging someone favorably is to speak negatively about people, to speak bad about people, to think bad about people. The Talmud says, Lashon Hara, slander kills three people. It kills the one who said it, it kills the one who heard it, and it kills the one who is spoken about. Now, the one who said it, obviously, is doing something bad. He's saying bad things about people. That's a no-no. Torah says not to do that. Torah says that sin is tantamount to idolatry and adultery and murder all put together. Okay. When you embarrass someone, you cause the blood to rush to your, their face. It's like spilling their blood. Slander is a bad thing. But why is it called? That's one explanation why it kills the person who's spoken about because it makes them embarrassed. It, it spills their blood. But there's a deeper explanation. Even if they never find out that you said slander about them in their life, and it never affected them. Sometimes slander can affect someone in their business. You know, the, someone slanders someone, no one wants to do business with them. It never affected their business. They, ne they never heard about it. They never knew about it. Yet, slander still kills them. Why? Because the very fact that someone sp speaks negatively about someone else, Kabbalah tells us, Hasidus tells us, the words themselves evoke and reveal the negative character traits in that person. The words themselves you say about someone else they conjure up all the negative energy in that person. So I am in Nova Scotia and you're in Berlin. And I, if I speak negatively about you, that will accentuate negative character within you, God forbid. So therefore the Mishnah tells us, judge everyone favorably. There's a beautiful teaching. I think it's in the Sfas Emes. He said, judge the whole person. It's a literal translation of the Mishnah favorably. You may judge someone, but you're only seeing part of the story. If you're able to see the entire picture, then you judge them favorably. You're only judging one detail, and that's why you are gravitating to see to see their fault. But if you judge the entire picture of that person, then you, you would naturally, of course, judge them favorably. So the Mishnah says, you should know it's something which is relevant and impactful, how you think about others. The previous Rebbe was once talking about the concept Machshava mo'elet, thought helps. He was speaking about how when you think about it and you pray for other people, wherever they are, you think good about someone, it helps them. So someone was at the present at the Fabrengen and he didn't really follow the whole train of thought that was being conveyed. And he asked at the previous Rebbe's gatherings, it was possible to have that kind of dialogue, question and answers. He said, what about the recipient? What does he gain from what your thoughts? about that person. So the previous Rebbe says he gains a great deal. And where were you last Sukkot? In other words, the previous Rebbe hinted that the reason why the person had left Soviet Russia and safely was free in Europe was because the previous Rebbe had thought about them and that his thoughts were beneficial. So that's, that's true in general, our thoughts about people, our prayers for people, but even forget about prayer. Just thinking good about people, giving them the benefit of the doubt and thinking good about them, that highlights the good in them, even if they don't even know you're thinking good about them. Just the fact that you are thinking good about them, that reveals good in them. Like King Solomon tells us in Proverbs, as water reflects your face, so too the feelings of your heart are reflecting the heart of another. You think good about someone, you think positively, kind thoughts about someone, they'll feel kind thoughts about you. But besides the kind thoughts, the very fact you think about someone's, someone in a good light that accentuates their good nature. The Rebbe said further that just the fact that you trust in God, that someone will turn out okay. There was someone who was worried about their brother. Their brother was having a real spiritual downfall. The Rebbe said the very fact you think about your brother in a positive way, you trust in God that your brother will be okay, that will help them be okay that your trust in God there, they're going to be okay, will lift them out of where they are. This is very pertinent to what we're learning about and we're mourning for right now, that the plague of the death of the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, they all died because they did not show respect, they didn't give honor for each other. It doesn't say they didn't love each other. It says they didn't show honor for each other. There's a big difference. Maimonides tells us the key to all relationships, the key to relationship between husband and wife and to all people. Maimonides says, a husband and a wife, when they get married, they have to know, they have to love, you have to love your wife like yourself. But more than that, 
more than love. My money's places on a pedestal. Respect, honor, honor, and honor and love are different. Love is about how I feel. I think you need to have another piece of cheesecake. I love you. I care about you. I have a piece of cheesecake. It's about me. I want to give it to you. Respect means I think about you. You're in the center. In love, I'm in the center. How I feel. In respect, you're in the center. So maybe that I have a different opinion than you. And Abikiva students certainly knew that they have to love each other like themselves. And as we learned in this week's Torah portion, and they were very into it. They were as truthful and honest and completely dedicated to loving their fellow like themselves. But because of that, every single one of his students had their own path in life. And the only, the only day that they tried to follow Rabbi Akiva, and they had to, because they cared about each other, share it with the other students. And they couldn't not share it because they cared about the other students who didn't get their way of life. So that's a good thing. What was missing is the respect. Just to respect the other person. Even the, while you're sharing and while you're caring, you still have to give the other person the benefit of the doubt that they are where they need to be and they, are, they have, that they're a person, there's someone else there in front of you. You have to give that person respect where they are and not, and, and not ex- use love as, a, as an excuse for hurting them and shaming them and disrespecting them even in, in a slight way. So that's the third instruction of the Mishnah judge everyone favorably, see the good in other people, honor them. And this is also true in, in marriage. My mind says that it's key that where the love stops, the respect has to begin, both from the husband to the wife, my mind says, and he says in the wife to the husband, that's the central uh, foundation in marriage. Many times couples have issues because they don't understand the dynamic of marriage. I don't feel the love today. I don't feel the love today. It's not what it's about. It's the honor and the respect that brings the good feelings afterwards. But the first the foundation is not the love. The foundation is the respect. And this is what the Mishnah is telling us. And this is told to us by Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachya, who was able to tell us this because he himself had all kinds of life experiences. He, at one point in his life, was a leader of the Jewish people. He led all the Jewish people. He was a prince. He was the head of the Jewish court. He was a leader. Therefore, he was able to tell us about leadership and how to look at people who know less than us and need to learn from us. He was then um, sought to be killed by King Yanai. King Yanai wanted to be the high priest. And King Yanai asked the sages for permission to be the high priest. The sages said, we have a problem. Your lineage isn't kosher enough for us. Well, they checked it out. His lineage was kosher enough. And in revenge, he killed all the sages of Israel. His wife was the sister of Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach, and she saved him, she hid him, because she, because it's her brother. And one other sage escaped, Rabbi Yeshua ben Prachia, the author of this Mishnah, and he escaped to Alexandria in Egypt, and he was in hiding in Egypt, and then he got a message from Rabbi Yeshua, from his colleague, uh, Rabbi Shimon ben Shetach, who said to him, he sent a cryptic message, I am here in, uh, in Jerusalem, I'm alone, my sister, my bride isn't here. He met, that was, in a, that was in a, a metaphor for his teacher. I'm missing you, please come back home. He came back. So he was down. He was a leader, then he was down. And his friendship with Rabbi Shimon and Shetach, his friends lifted him back up. We see Rabbi Shimon and Prash, was well-suited, he's well-endowed to give us insight in all scenarios in our life, whether we're up, or people in our lives that know less than us, people in our lives which are the same as us, and people in our lives which are our own downfalls. How do you lift yourself up? So Joseph and Shubin Prashkia, how did he lift himself up? He went, his friends lifted him back up. He needed his friends. In this particular talk, Rebbe didn't mention this, but Shubin Prashkia was famously the teacher of JC. And some commentaries say, and there have mentioned this as well, I'm not sure that I've mentioned this, but some of the commentaries say the reason why he was the one who said, judge everyone favorably, was because of an encounter he had with JC. He had kicked JC out of the study hall because of things that JC had said that he felt were, were unbecoming of a yeshiva student. And JC wanted to return to the yeshiva. And Yeshiva and Prachia refused to let him in. After kicking him out several times, JC shows up one day. And Bishuman and Prachi is in the middle of reciting the Shema. While he's in the middle of reciting the Shema, JC is there, and JC says, please let me back in the yeshiva. Bishuman and Prachi is in the middle of saying Shema, so he says, wait. 
And JC thought he was saying to him, skedaddle, I don't want you. Now, this was the last time he was going to try. And this sign to him was, he felt, JC felt, I said, I'm not wanted, I'm, I'm gonna do my own thing. And he started his own religion. And how many people were killed as a result of that finger that said to him, wait a second. So that's why Yeshua and Prachya taught us from his experience, the Rebbe says, to always judge people favorably. You don't know what's going inside someone. That, of course, JC had a lot of demons inside of him, a lot of bad things inside of him, which that little finger was able to set off all those things. But had the Bishub and Prachya had the foresight at that moment to know what was going on in the life of his student, he wouldn't have done that. He would have interrupted a Shman who would say to him, my brother, my son, I want you in the issue. Interesting, another encounter Talmud says that, that Jay, he later came to JC and he saw, that, saw him and he said, come back to Yeshiva. And JC said, I learned from you, it's impossible to repent once you cause others to sin. But the point is, Rabbi Shumar Prachya was a, had a very, very colorful life. And therefore he was the one who was endowed to give us this great insight, how we have to respect other people, how we have to learn from other people, and how we have to cherish friendship. Now it's, it's when we're down, especially now in time of quarantine, you have to look out and seek and invest time to call people up who so cherish, so many people are so alone and just would care which would be, be so inspired if just someone would reach out and touch them and make a phone call to them. So th this is really the call of the hour. And uh, I just wanna say that we're the time of Mashiach, time of redemption and Mashiach will come. We're gonna feel, the Rebbe says, the love and closeness like a family. We have to start that now and taste of that now by by judging and seeing other the good in others, and that brings the good out in them. Even people you know, their businesses are out to get you in the past. If they've done things to it, the fact you didn't benefit the doubt, and you try to over start fresh with them, that brings out the best in them. And that's what I wanted to share tonight. Any questions, comments, criticism, tomatoes, cucumbers? Okay, thank you all for joining. All the best. Have good night. Have good Shabbos. Thank you. Good Shabbos. Thank you.